It's, uh, it's an honor to have you here, Joe. It's great to be here. Thanks, everybody. I should, full disclosure, I've been a lifelong Democrat, but I don't think there's a Republican candidate I've rooted for more <laughs> than maybe Abraham Lincoln. I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, you. So, you know, if, if what we'd like to get a sense from you here is what your path is. Um, to the extent you can talk about it, we're kind of wonks here about media marketing. I know you're not an expert per se on that. You've been a radio talk show host. Um, but if I go on your, if I do a Google search for you right now, uh, the first organic search that comes up is um, from Google and says, that's not a setup for a joke. And that's, I think, your own paid search. Um, sorry, Google's talking to me. Um, so why should we take you seriously? Um, and I don't know that you should. I hope you do. Look, um, le and let's just be clear from the outset. Uh, I announced about five months ago uh, that this former Republican congressman is going to take on a sitting Trump, a sitting president named Trump. Um, nobody, Joe, in their right mind should think about doing this unless you have a really good reason. It's easily the most freaking difficult thing I've ever done. Uh, as you mentioned, I mean, I come from a certain place politically. Most of the people in that world politically, ah, they love Trump. So I've lost my friends. I've lost my supporters. I get threats all the time. It's been difficult. The party has tried to whack me every single day. Uh, I'm doing it, and I got into it, Joe, knowing it would be difficult. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm many things, but I'm not dumb. I knew it would be difficult. I thought it was important. I believe he's unfit. So it's that message that we've led with, which is, I know who I am. I know this isn't going to be easy, but that guy in the White House scares the hell out of me. He should scare everybody. And we've led with that message in everything we do. Well, can you talk a little bit about what your strategy is with media to the extent you can? I know you don't have a super fundraising budget yet, although hopefully that'll come. Mike Bloomberg doesn't have our money. Not even close. Look, it um, <laughs> delayed reaction from the audience on that. If I had Mike Bloomberg's money, oh my God, the things I could do. Because, look, here, here's, and here's what I knew intrinsically going in. And I found this out on, on the first or second day of campaigning, of talking to real voters, not the idiots at, at like Sean Hannity and all these other idiots who are all paid to protect Trump. When you talk to real Republican voters, they're, they're tired of this president. Um, we just led with absolute naked honesty from day one. This is a long shot. We're going to do guerrilla style things. We're going to we're going to go at, we're going to go on Twitter and Facebook and, and every avenue we can do to put our message out there. We're not going to lie to people and say that we've got a great chance to win. Um, we tried from the get go to get on national TV a lot, um, and that's been difficult because again, Fox News and the conservative media world wants nothing to do with me. In fact, funny story, Fox News accidentally had me on in mid-September, Stuart Varney. Um, and it was an accident. And Stuart Varney didn't want me on. And when I came on, you could tell he didn't want me on because he was in a really bad mood. He was in, and, and it finally got to the point where he and I went back and forth. And, and I asked him a question because he said, the president never lies. And I said, Stuart, tell me, has Donald Trump ever told a lie to the American people? And he said, no. And I said, again, Stuart, I asked him again. So that went viral. And so Fox News wants nothing to do with me ever, ever since. We've understood that we've got to get a little bit of a, a magic. Like uh, on, on a much smaller scale on the Republican side, like what a Pete Buttigieg did on the Democrat side when he caught magic and he had that CNN town hall and then all of a sudden Buttigieg became the thing. We've tried to do that on a smaller scale on the Republican side using the tools that we can use. If I might suggest, make your name harder to pronounce. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so something must be working because even with the loss of your Repu conservative media base, you've lost your own outlets, your own talk shows through Salem communications and, and WIND. Um, 
something's working because um, just this week, if, if you don't mind putting those slides up, uh, we did our own research. Uh, I was struck earlier in the week, we received from Engagement Labs a word of mouth study on Democratic candidates' uh, conversations tracking from the voter base of Democratic registered voters. So we decided to, I asked them if they had anything on Republicans and they said no. So we fielded our own research, we used the same method, the same audience base, this time registered Republican voters. And what we found was that in the past week, the conversations uh, tracking for the three candidates, you score about 10%, which is, a, if you don't mind putting the next slide up, just to compare how that contrasts with um, the Democratic candidates, that would put you somewhere between Pete Buttigieg and Andrew Yang or Take Trump's that, party. Andrew Yang. <laughs> and you're not giving away any money at this point. <laughs> no, I wish I had his money. Yeah. Um, well, what, what does that tell you? How do you react to that? That's really, that, Joe, that's fascinating. I think, I think part of it is that we've been very aggressive in, and I don't want this to sound, to sound negative, but when you're in a position like this and you're doing what I'm doing, you're trying to put this face wherever you can put it. And we announced at the end of August, and there isn't a media outlet that we've turned down. There isn't a TV talk show that we've turned down. There isn't a podcast that we've turned down. I'm addicted to Twitter. So, I, I mean, we, we are like crazy on Twitter and Facebook, and, um, it, and we put out a lot of videos. I think, it's, I think it's just being really aggressive, and I do think it's, it's the message. Um, uh, old, young, white, black, and brown, wherever you are uh, right now in the audience, whoever you are, this is a unique time in American politics. And people have strong opinions about that guy in the White House. And so I think a lot of it is there was a bit of a yearning to have somebody on our side out there pounding them every day, even among Republicans. Well, the irony of this state is we were talking to Republican registered voters and if what you're saying is true, that you've been closed out of the conservative right-wing media, uh, I'd be curious if we went back and asked Democratic voters what kind of, not that it matters for you at the polling booth, but just to see how you stack. I would venture to say you're getting more of a conversation and a lift from the mainstream and the left at this point than you are from the right. I would bet that mainstream and the left media uh, is talking about me more than conservative media. I would imagine on that spectrum right there, I'd be even further toward, I'd be ahead of Bloomberg. I'd be up, I'd be up there somewhere. Um, there's been great receptivity, Joe, and we've had to use that and work with that among mainstream and more leftist media uh, because we're united in the cause of what I'm doing. So the other thing we notice is what an insurmountable incumbency Donald Trump has. Uh, actually, I'm surprised that he doesn't have a 100% conversation in the party, but that's what it showed. But there's another chart I'd like to put up, and then that'll be it for the eye charts. Um, because what we also asked is what the sentiment was of those conversations. And, um, you know, no surprise there. I mean, people are polarized on Donald Trump. They're either way positively for him or against him, even within his own party. Um, but you look, and, and your competitor, Bill Weld, look like there's tremendous more upside for you. To, um, to gain people and, and to gain um, positive respect, basically. So it's very polarizing right now. And the mess, I, I guess the messenger that I am and the message that I've taken forth is trying to rise above the polarization. I'm a Tea Party conservative who hates Donald Trump. Um, that, that kind of rises above the tribal nature of politics we're in right now. And paradoxically, I think there's a great yearning, especially among independents and Democrats, uh, for, a, t for us to move away from the tribal aspect of our politics. I, I don't think you see that as much in the conservative world. They're still into the tribal nature because their guy is the king. But I think our message that we've been putting out there has been received really favorably by people outside of Fox News. Well, if, when you get into the general election, uh, you can draw from the other side. But at this point, your goal is to move the needle on, on this constituency. Yes. How, how are you going to do that? Uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, and, and again, just for some context, 
Um, it's difficult to take on a sitting president. It's difficult to take this president on because he literally does. And I know this because these were the people who listened to me on the radio every single day. When Donald Trump says, as he said, that I can shoot somebody in the middle of Manhattan and 35% of my supporters will still support me, he speaks the truth. I love to pause after that. <laughs> he speaks the truth. There will be part of that a decent part of that base that I can never pick off, even though they like where I am on the issues. But that is, Joe, that's a small percentage of the Republican Party. You read these polls that say, Donald Trump has 90% of support among Republicans. Bullshit. Um, those are self-identified Republicans. Every single day I'm bumping into people who've left the Republican Party because of him. So I think there's a decent chance to fight him to a draw, a decent chance. There's a chance to fight him to a draw, and with him and all of the, the bad stuff that he does every day, who knows politically what life's going to look like in two to three months. So let's talk about the path over those next two to three months. Um, what is your strategy for, um, you've been blacklisted by the base media, um, you've been closed out of primaries. Uh, I think it's 20 states now. 10 have officially closed their primaries. Okay. Another 10 are trying or making it really difficult. So what's the path to a nomination in, in that scenario? And, and on top of that, the, the factor, the, the media factor, the communications factor I'd place on top of that is impeachment. Mm -hmm. I announced a month before the Ukraine scandal hit. And I can tell you, and I think every Democrat candidate will tell you the same thing if they're honest. In, it, look, Trump deserved to be impeached, in my opinion, but it has sucked all the oxygen out of the room. Demo I mean, from Klobuchar to, I mean, Cory Booker's out now. The Democrats have been screaming to get attention in this impeachment, and now the Senate trial is going to begin. So what it's forced us to do, whereas before Ukraine hit, we, had, we were getting tons of national attention. It's forced us to go local. So we're on local Iowa radio, New Hampshire radio every day. We're in the local newspapers in Iowa and New Hampshire every day. We've got local groups and local... It's amazing how many... Every, everybody's got a podcast. So we've been forced to go underground and really focus hard on Iowa and New Hampshire, but primarily Iowa. And in this environment we're in, Joe, it's, it's, it's our goal to surprise people with a pretty good number in Iowa so that people then say, wow, there is something going on in the Republican side. So it's all about building momentum, getting those inflection points. You have yes. one of them already tracking here. So Iowa's the next big inflection point for you. If you get on base, that'll rally into the next stage. A absolutely. I was in about two and a half weeks. My, this, this insurgency campaign needs almost every Republican to wake up the day after Iowa and say, son of a gun. Joe Walsh got, boom, X percent of the vote in Iowa. I had no idea. Well, that's interesting. And then when that happens, money comes in. And then, and then more people then reach out to us. And then a week later is New Hampshire. And you hope then that carries to another surprising number in New Hampshire. And then on the Republican side, this is important politically, after New Hampshire, we go dark for a month because Donald Trump canceled primaries. So then there's nothing until Super Tuesday. So our little choo-choo engine here is trying to really surprise people in Iowa, New Hampshire, and then build up a lot of momentum for Super Tuesday. Okay. So our industry, advertising and media, talks a lot about direct-to-consumer marketing. And in politics, we attribute a lot of that originally to Donald Trump because he did do the rallies. He went direct to consumers, uh, bypassed a lot of traditional media with Twitter and Facebook, et cetera. Um, how are you going to, um, you're doing that on the campaign trail now, um, but how are you going to do that with media? If you've been closed out of um, Salem and um, your radio show, have you thought about creating your own podcast or YouTube channel or, or something? Obviously, the audience is still there for you. Yes, and in fact, it's our hope to begin putting out a, an official campaign podcast this next week as we really go into a two-week push in Iowa and, as you said, speak directly um, to voters. But 
Joe, part of the deal, too, is here, and again, this is just running for president, um, there are these points. And if we surprise people in Iowa and New Hampshire, this demand, you know, Donald Trump telling Fox News, don't put Joe Walsh on, don't put Joe Walsh on. If we do well in Iowa and New Hampshire, that wall is going to begin to break down a little bit. And more and more people are going to have to put me on. Uh, it, 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 it's going to work that way. But yeah, I mean, a, a campaign podcast talking directly to people is something we're going to launch this next week. Oh, great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your messaging. So um, if I go on some of your search ads, which uh, the only paid media I could find for you, I know you haven't spent a lot so far. Um, your current campaign on Google search is, uh, we're tired of the lies, we're, we're tired of the drama. Um, but you know, your history has a little bit of drama in it, specifically oh, yeah. rhymes with Obama. Um, why should we believe you now in that regard? Well, in full disclosure, just so everybody knows me, I voted for Trump in 2016. Not because I loved him or liked him, he wasn't Hillary. Um, I, I, I didn't pay a lot of attention to Trump prior to him running for the president when I voted for him. Uh, and again, he blocked me on Twitter during that campaign. So I was never like a big Trump fan, but I did vote for him and I supported him on the radio. Um, like a lot of Republicans did because they didn't want uh, Hillary. Look, I've been, what's been really interesting about this run, Joe, is I went to Congress in 2010. I was part of that Tea Party class. I went there, I was pissed off at both parties for bankrupting future generations, and I went there to fight. I was outspoken and loud, and oftentimes in that fight, and in the five or six years on the radio, I, in my fight, 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 I'd go over my skis, and I'd say stupid things, and I'd get personal, and I'd say offensive things. This run for office, Joe, has been almost like a redemption tour, uh, because I have publicly apologized for the role that I played in helping to put Trump in the White House which is kind of an interesting dynamic. I call myself a reformed outlaw. Trump's an outlaw, I'm a reformed outlaw. And it was really, Joe, watching him in the White House, day after day, insult and just spew out mean, cruel crap at people that really kind of forced me to realize, oh my God, did I sound like that four or five years ago? Trump has helped me change my tone. But that's definitely part of my message. I help. I I can't stand this guy, and I help put him in the White House. So speaking of media, you have a book coming out. Um, I don't know if I can say the title. But yes, say it. F F asterisk S C K, um, silence. Can I? Hey Lucy, can I say it? Can I say it? This is an adult crowd here, but I can't. So I have a book coming out uh, in mid-February. It's called Fuck Silence, Calling Trump Out for the Moronic, Cultish, Authoritarian Con Man He Is. And the point of the book is, it's the point of my campaign. I wouldn't be doing this unless I thought he was a threat. Uh, I believe he's what our founders feared. The point of the book is, and I'm a conservative, I'd rather have a socialist in the White House than a dictator. That's really the point of the book. So it's also great, tangible, collateral media that'll help you get on, not that you need it, but on talk shows and other circuits. It's, uh, I mean, it's not the first time a candidate or an elected official wrote a book. I didn't run for president so I could write a book. Um, it happened after I announced. I think it will certainly, because it does fit with the mission of the campaign, I think it will lead to an influx of media and attention, which will help. I'm just thinking of all those anchors and interviewers trying to pronounce the title of the book, but <laughs> that's another problem. Um, well, I was on, I was on with, uh, I was on Dan Rather's podcast a couple days ago, and he wouldn't say it. He said, "Screw silence." <laughs> I think that's editorializing. What else are you going to do? Who's editorializing? Yes. Um, Okay, so in the messaging, uh, what are the other themes uh, you want to hit on? And, and, and frankly, why aren't you hitting the RNC directly on their re constraint of trade? I mean, basically, they're blocking a democratic process by not allowing you to participate, not allowing voters to have a chance. So this morning, I was at Republican Party headquarters. I wanted to have a meeting with the Republican National Committee folks because, again... 
And I, I, it's, it, it just it saddens me that the whole country doesn't know this is happening because this has never happened before. No, this isn't Putin. This isn't Russia. Donald Trump has canceled primary elections in 10 states. I mean, that's bullshit. Think about that. Millions and millions of Republican voters around the country, Joe, are not going to be able to vote for president this year. I'm a lifelong Republican. I'm a Republican former member of Congress. I'm a Republican candidate for president. I went to Republican headquarters this morning to talk about that, and nobody, nobody would meet with me. Uh, I, look, I know, right, with Trump, it's impeachment, it's something, it's a scandal every day. This should be one of the biggest issues in the country because it's never been done before. Never been done. And the party is doing it because Donald Trump is telling them to do it. Ah. Ah. I just... Honestly... I, I apologize. It, it's, look, it's going to be hard enough... Even it, it, unless I had Bloomberg's money, it's going to be hard enough to beat him. But when you just take 10 states off the table like that, it's wrong. Well, it's ironic given the fact that the party and the administration have talked so much about Democrats denying the voters' right to be heard yeah. that in this case, they literally are blocking the voters' right. And, and so, here, Joe, you talk about messaging. <laughs> maybe most of, and I'm a conservative, but maybe most of my messaging right now, because what I, of what I'm doing right now, appeals to independents and Democrats. Because I right now, as a Republican, have no problem saying that my party is not a party anymore. It's a cult. Before Trump, you were, def as a Republican, before Trump, you were defined by where you stood on the issues. Before Trump, Fox News loved me. Fox News would have me on all the time. Why? Because Joe Walsh is an outspoken conservative. We love that kind of shit on TV. Then along comes Trump, and now it's, uh, I don't care where you are on the issues, where are you on Trump? Well, I'm a conservative still, but I don't like Trump. Okay, I don't want you on Fox News. The parties become a cult to one man. And, and no matter where any of us are politically, everybody sh in this country should demand and want us to have two really engaged political parties. So the irony at, in this primary phase is uh, you're not really an insurgent because you've been blocked from the inside. You're moving from the outside in. Well, that's interesting. I concur. I mean, you obviously, from our data, you're generating conversations within the party and a fair amount of positivity, but the traction you're getting is from mid, middle of the road or progressive media outlets. And, you know, we'll go back in and we'll do a, a, a general survey to see how you're tracking conversationally with the mainstream audience as well. Um, and don't forget, Joe, uh, I had a bit of an advantage before I announced because I was a nationally syndicated radio guy for five or six years. So Republicans and conservatives around the country knew who I was and identified with who I was. Sure. But, but this has been a really weird experience for them because I was in many ways a leader of their team and now I'm running against their team. So how much of that conversation do you think is being generated from the fact that they're indignant about the way the Republican Party is treating competition? All I can tell you is when we pull Republican voters in the states where their primaries have been canceled, 70 to 80 to 5 percent of Republican voters are outraged. What do you mean? I can't vote for president next year? South Carolina, Minnesota, I mean all over the country. They have no idea. And when they find out about it, they get angry. Um, so have you thought about any other recourse, like a petition campaign? It worked for Tom Steyer, obviously got him on base with need to impeach. Um, why wouldn't you generate a petition campaign and throw in with Bill Weld, you know, to get To do what? Ballot? To get on the ballot? Yeah. Here's the problem, and most people don't know this. Uh, the state parties in each state can do whatever they want. Um, the state parties in each state decide what the rules of their elections are going to be. So the South Carolina State Party all by themselves can say, nope, if they get a call from Donald Trump, nope, we're not going to have a primary. Our, our elections in this country are run at the state level, and the primaries are run by the state private organizations. So you can sue, 
and there have been lawsuits in some states, unsuccessful to date. But what if you started a grassroots petition in each state to appeal to their um, parties? So that's the only other recourse we have, and a petition would be an interesting way to do it. The only other recourse we have is to generate, I mean, a boatload of anger among Republicans in these states. Absolutely. Well, uh, it seems like there is some anger going on there, but the question is, how do you activate it? So, Well, have, have, have 100,000 Republicans in South Carolina tell their state party, you got a week to change this. What do you mean I can't vote for president? That kind of thing. Right. Can you be written in in any way? Yeah, some of the, uh, no, like, like Minnesota. Ah! Here I go again. In Minnesota, one person, the state party chair, a woman, all by herself said, nope, no primary, and, and they eliminated any room for a write-in candidate. I think a few other states eliminated even room for a write-in candidate. Okay. Um, well, I know we have an apt or, a rapt audience here who's interested in, in asking some questions of you. Um, this would be a good time if you want to um, speak up. Have a hand back here. Hi, um, I heard President Trump joke about um, canceling term limits and in, in possibly being president for life. Um, with this cult-like mentality that the Republican Party has, do you see that as a possibility? That's a great question. Um, no, because I think all of the rest of us would rise up and pick him up and throw him out of the White House. Um, but yes, in that, I believe in his screwed up head, he thinks about it. Um, and, and from a messaging perspective, I think right now we got a lot of chicken shits in the Republican Party who a lot of my former colleagues in the House and Senate, they think Trump's going to lose in November. They want Trump to lose in November. You know a guy like Mitt Romney wants Trump to lose. Of course he does. He doesn't have the courage to say that, but he does. And then they think, Rubio too, little Marco, they think then, they, he pisses me off. All these Republicans who don't have the balls to say what they think, they all think then that when Trump loses, he's just going to go away and the Republican Party can go back to what it was before Trump. No, Donald Trump ain't going away unless he's in jail. He's not going away. He'll grab Sean Hannity, Lou Dobbs. He'll grab his billion followers and he'll try to screw things up for Republicans for a long, long time. So even if he doesn't try to stay in the White House, and by the way, if he loses in November, he can run again in 2024. Who knows what he's going to do? That's why you got to confront him now. Joe, your campaign has some similarities to Bernie in 2016. Yeah. Since an insurgency against an establishment candidate. Bernie was able to show signs of life through that grassroots fundraising. People who were supporting him who didn't have to worry about the wrath of, uh, of, a, part, of a party leadership, who could, who could contribute to you and, and there, was, there were no ramifications unlike all of the, the pundits in the media who, are, who seem to be su supporting Trump. What are you seeing those sorts of signs of life through those various direct-to-consumer channels that can start funding your campaign, that can register this 10% sentiment. Yeah. Where, tell us where you're seeing some of that. Yeah, the, the problem is, um, and we talk about communications, um, major Republican donors won't give me money because they fear Trump. Conservative media won't have me on because they fear Trump. State parties are canceling primaries because they fear Trump. So from the beginning, we knew our only path was to do a lot of down here and a lot of grassroots stuff and, and catch some magic and go viral. Um, again, a la Buttigieg and a la Bernie in, in 16. And we've done that to a degree. The, uh, guys, I haven't had any money. We, we haven't had any money. So the fact that we're even being talked about is amazing. Um, but we need a lot more of that. And I think the difference is Bernie wasn't up against a sitting president with a cult-like 
following. It's profound. So, so on the assumption that you will be the candidate and be elected in November, I'd like to ask you your position on, on some of the issues. Yeah. Um, so you are uh, on your website and in, in your talk show, you've talked about how you are a fiscal conservative, you're for free trade, you're for the Second Amendment. Closer to home for our industry, how do you feel about the First Amendment? And how would you, what kind of policies would you put in place for the media industry? Um, Look, I think, I actually think um, the most damaging thing Donald Trump has done is his attack on the First Amendment, is his attack on speech, is his attack on the media. I saw some Republican United States Senator today who was asked a question about impeachment, and she lashed out and said, get out of here, you hack, you liberal hack. This kind of thing is happening more and more. It's happening because we have a president who has repeatedly called the media the enemy of the people. Um, it's frightening what he, and think about it, he's the president of the United States. On, uh, from his Twitter feed, he can tweet something out attacking the media, attacking private industry, uh, uh, boosting up private companies, attacking individuals, it's really scary what he's doing to free speech and the free press. Um, do you have any views on campaign finance reform? Obviously, you're an underdog right now. I do. I do. And, and, and uh, my reform will probably not be liked by everybody in the room. Look, I'm not, I, I'm not Michael Bloomberg. I'm not a wealthy guy. So for me to raise money, I have to raise it 1000 or $2,000 at a time. That's really, really hard. Um, so you spend a lot of time trying to raise money. And so the problem is really wealthy guys with their own money can come in and not worry about those limits. So my campaign finance reform would be get rid of all the limits now uh, and full and instant disclosure. So Joe, uh, this growing relationship here, if you really like me and you want to write me a check for $100,000, I believe you should be able to, but then that should instantly be disclosed. And everybody in this room should know that Joe gave Joe $100,000. And if you're angry that Joe gave Joe $100,000, then take it out on me and don't vote for me. Um, but every time we place limits on how much I can raise, your politicians who aren't wealthy spend all their time raising money. So transparency. Total transparency. Okay, this is not really a campaign issue per se, but it's very topical this week. Um, do you think a woman could be president? I think, woman, I think a woman should be president. Um, I think it's bizarre that, that we have not elected a female president yet. Okay, any more questions from the audience? I would love that. Okay. If we could get a microphone to this gentleman. Uh, where, I'm sorry, where? Hi, <clears throat> Dave Matson from Not Ordinary Media. Um, I'm, I'm still uh, cannot figure out why the Republican rank and file um, has never uh, really gotten s upset, as far as I can tell, anyway, about Trump's seeming affinity for Russia and and Putin. And why? I mean, when I grew up in the '80s. You know, during the Cold War, like, they were the bad guys. <laughs> no two ways about it. And, uh, you know, the Republican Party was, like, very, you know, hawkish on that. But it seems like it's a non-issue. It, it totally baffles me. Just from a communications standpoint, I don't, I don't understand why that doesn't resonate. So it, you're right. That and there are a hundred examples of that, of things that Trump does that if Obama had done, we'd be, like, running through walls. So here's what everybody needs to understand. And I guess I understand it because I come from the world. The same people who voted for Trump voted for me. The same people who voted for Trump have listened to me on the radio. Here's the deal. Donald Trump is an absolute punch in the face retribution for them, for his supporters. They don't care what he does. It's, I'm not exaggerating when I say and this should bother all of us, no matter where we are politically. 
He lies almost every time he opens his mouth. It doesn't bother his hardcore supporters. They were so angry at the way they perceived uh, the media was treating them. Um, again, look, I'm in this world. This has been my world forever. Generally, people in the media lean left. I know that. People in academia lean left. Uh, people in, in most of our institutions lean left. And all of the Trump supporters thought that these people have been looking down on us. They've been talking bad about us. And along comes a demagogue who says, I'm going to take care of you. It's not your fault you're unemployed. It's the other guy's fault. It's that brown person's fault. It's CNN's fault. I'm gonna, I got your back. So he comes in and he gets elected and he just punches CNN in the face every day. So they don't care what he does from a policy perspective. If Donald Trump raised taxes tomorrow, they'd cheer. If Donald Trump declared war on Iran tomorrow, they'd cheer. It doesn't matter what he does. Um, he is, he's payback for them. Now, I think that's really sad. Uh, I think it's wrong, but I just want you to understand where most of his supporters are coming from. But Joe, knowing that, doesn't that indicate that there's, that that's a real messaging, go, going back to sort of traditional brand advertising, that's a real messaging problem there. Um, for? Are, this is not, for you. Yeah. This is not an argument anymore. This is something else. We're working at another level, a subtler level, of no. where, where your arguments, you've already, you, you know, you already agree, there are many people in the Republican Party who already agree with you, um, but they're not going to act on it. So, so, where, so is there really an argument here, or is this really something that's running much deeper? It has much more to do with identity and with other, with other issues, and I wonder, how do you counter argument? Well, yeah, and, and look, for a year... Because I felt this way about Trump for a couple of years. So for a year, I, I, I publicly encouraged some Republican better than me, Mitt Romney, John Kasich, some Republican get in and challenge Trump. Because I know you know he's unfit. Nobody got in, so I got in. Look, Mitt Romney couldn't beat Donald Trump in a primary. Conservative Republicans hate Romney. Conservative Republicans hate Kasich. Weirdly, a moderate or a more establishment Republican would have been destroyed in a primary. The, the path that we tried to take was, I'm a conservative. I mean, I'm a real conservative, which is where most of his supporters are when you really talk to him about issues. You just won't get all the crap and all the cruelty and all the chaos if you vote for somebody like me. That's the, that's the path that we've tried to carve knowing that it's difficult because, as my friend over here said, it's, it, support for Trump really isn't issues-based. He's just their demagogue who's going to punch who they think are the bad guys. Right. You can't argue with resentment. It's not, you can't counter-argue resentment. You can't talk not, somebody out of resentment. Not at all. No. Not at all. And it's going to be, and as you said, it's going to be with us for a long time. And we look, need to, we need to figure this out because it's going to be yeah, with us. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. I think you mentioned before the, this, fan, this fantasy that somehow, even if he's not elected, this is a this is a potent and important political force that we have to deal with and find. Again, go back to sort of branding rhetoric. Yeah. We need to find a counter argument or a way of arguing this in a whole different way. Yeah, look, uh, many of you may think I'm nuts for doing this. Uh, a lot of my family thinks I'm nuts that I did this. Um, I wouldn't have done it unless I thought I could win. But let's be real. I also did it because this is not my Republican Party. I don't like what this guy has done to the issues I believe in. I don't like what this guy, I don't like how this guy is treating half of the country. So part of why I did this was to let people out there know that there still are, you know, good, decent Republicans who believe in freedom, limited government opportunity. We're not all cruel bigots and liars. Well, thank Where? you for drawing attention. Oh, wait. We have, a, we have, I'm sorry, we have One last question, question I just yeah. wanted to ask you. Um, but in 2000, like even in, by 2016, 17, you were still pretty outspoken pro-Trump. And at that point, it was very clear, like he was president, it was very clear what he was. So I'm just trying to understand where that shift happened for you. And also, my last question is, 
looking back in retrospect, would you still have voted for Trump or would you have voted for Hillary? Um, oh my God, this isn't gonna get me any votes in the Republican primary. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, there's no way in hell I would have voted for Donald Trump. I'll leave that at that. Look, here's what I did with Trump and I've apologized. I've been on my knees. Um, when he got, I did not pay attention much to Donald Trump before the 16 election. I'm older than a lot of people in this room. I didn't even know what his reality TV show was. I always figured he was just a goof. And so I figured if Donald Trump wins, he's a goof, he's a blowhard, maybe he'll appoint a few good people and maybe a few good things might happen. And, and then when Trump won, I did the whole good Trump, bad Trump thing. I'd pat him on the head when I thought he did something good, and I'd kick him in the ass when I thought he did something bad. Over the course of days, weeks, and months, it became clear to me, I don't like this guy. I don't like most of what he's doing. Two things finally moved me officially, publicly off of him. And remember, this is important. At the time, I was a conservative talk radio guy. 95% of my audience are the red hat, mega-wearing folks. So it was difficult to do what I did. But over time, I realized, I realized pretty quickly that almost every time he opens his mouth, he tells a lie. I can't have that in a president. The final straw from, for me, when I publicly said, I will never say another good word about him, was Helsinki 2018, when he stood in front of the world and said, I believe Putin and not my own people. I went on the radio that night. I said, he's a traitor. That's an act of disloyalty. Uh, my audience pretty much gave up on me, but that was the final straw for me. Okay, so um, if I could ask one concluding uh, question. Um, Republican convention comes and goes next summer. You don't get the nomination. What happens then? Is there a path for you in the general election or do you have If another? I don't become the Republican nominee. Correct. I'm asked this every day. Joe, why don't you just run as an independent? And there are a lot of intriguing communication aspects of running as an independent. Uh, in my head and my heart, I, 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 I have pledged to myself that I am willing to, to fall on any sword in the world. I, all I want to do is stop this man. Um, so if I don't get the Republican nomination, I will do whatever I can beyond that to make sure he does not get reelected, whether that's an independent run, whether that's whatever. I believe, and I'll close with this, you guys have been great. It's probably way too much politics. You'd rather talk your stuff. I really believe this is one of those unique moments in history uh, where we all, we all got to stand up. I mean it. In your neighborhoods, in your professions, in your little communities, this is one of those weird, unique moments in American history where we all have to step up and do what you believe in. That's what I've dedicated my year to. Thank you. You guys have been great. Thanks. Yeah.